the time in late December The sun stands still in winter For three days, three long nights Throughout time we watched the sky and waited for the sun to come and save us. Save us from the longest night. For years I was doing things and singing songs that don't make any sense. But if I scratch the surface just a little bit, the holiday paint was very thin. Look to the sky for hope and wonder. There's a star in the east to guide The longest night Oh, night Diva Oh, night Oh, night Glenda, get, get back up here. She walks off and doesn't let everybody, this is Glenda um, channeling Melissa Etheridge along with Brad, Jonathan, and Matt. Thank you so very much. So please, please let us acknowledge you and say thank you for that beautiful thing. <laughs> Whew, holy moly. My goodness. Okay, between uh, Cindy's prayer and that song, oh my gosh. Now, I'm not sure I have a whole lot to add, but you know, I'm paid to talk, so you gotta listen. <laughs> Ooh, man. I used to only cry on Silent Night, now I cry on that song every time. Ooh, man. Yeah. There's so much going on in all these holidays and um, we've been working our way through and of course we're talking about the emergence of the cosmic light because we are inspired now by the winter solstice and that is Melissa Etheridge's beautiful um, song for the winter solstice and to remind us that um, there's something powerful going on. 
right? And in the solstices and the equinoxes, these are all really powerful moments um, in the space-time continuum on our beautiful, beautiful, beautiful planet, um, in our lovely human suits that we are in, having these amazing experiences. And this, uh, these um, precious times are so very important. And of course, the winter solstice and the um, celebration of the winter solstice has really been renewed um, through the pagan and, and or neo-pagan and Wiccan traditions. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that because I think we forget how deeply embedded our holiday traditions are um, in these ancient, ancient celebrations um, and along with the fact that we are individualized expressions of the one, we are those expressions incarnated and embodied here on planet Earth in this beautiful nature and expression of life. These two things are simultaneously true. Right, last week we talked about the time and effort that it takes to grow spiritually. The week before, we recognize that life is just not always in the light. And yeah, it's not always roses and miracles. Um, next um, week, we'll be talking about the cosmic Christ and the consciousness of that revelation. And finally, the last week, we'll wrap it all up in how important community is in all of this. But the roots of all of these traditions, particularly in the West, particularly um, in the North, um, in, um, in the Europe and American traditions, which have um, for so long been so ubiquitous due to colonization, has been all over the world, and now, of course, for the um, economics of it all. <laughs> uh, you might be surprised to know that America is only number 12 on the amount of money that's spent in December for the holidays. The U.S. is only number 12 on the list. <laughs> so you think it's crazy here. Um, but, but our roots are so deep. And, um, and sometimes we forget that the, so many of the Christmas traditions that we have actually come and borrow, well, I don't want to say borrow from, quite frankly, they co-opted the traditions that were discovered um, in Northern Europe, um, in Europe and Northern Europe as the Roman Empire spread. And as you may recall, the Roman Empire in 323, um, um, the, uh, the, Rome, uh, the Roman Emperor Constantine, he converted to Christianity because he saw the cross in the sky and the um, priest had said, w you know, God will help you cross the river, and that was the beginning of the, ex the expansion of the Roman Empire. And Rome, the Roman Empire was Catholic, and they took um, Catholicism, which was the only Christianity at the time. They took Catholicism all the way up, all the way up to the uh, northernmost parts of Europe and on into the British Isles. And so everywhere where they went, they found um, already indigenous traditions. We often think of indigenous traditions as our Native American here in the United States, indigenous traditions in Africa, in Australia, the Maoris in New Zealand, and, and yet there, there, surprisingly as it may sound to all of us, there were actually indigenous traditions um, in Europe as well. And those traditions are so much of the seed of the way we celebrate this uh, holiday called Christmas um, outside of the story of the virgin birth that we find in the Bible. So, yeah, we, I, we don't always know how heavily we borrow. So, so, so that was a nice little preamble. Okay, good, now we know where we are. Um, so, so let me say two other things. First of all, we, I was really planning on having a ritual today. And the problem is, 
first of all, I don't always know how to include the people, those of you online. And the only ritual I could think of was to give you all a little tiny piece of a fir tree um, as a representation of all that we're going to talk about today. The problem is by the time you leave here, that little tiny piece of fir tree is going to be dead and brown. And you might, I might hand it to you and you're like, what is this? <laughs> right? So in lieu of handing you a fir tree, a little piece of fir tree, and for those of you online, we're just going to invite you to imagine that I've handed you a little piece of fir tree. <laughs> Uh, or, no, a little piece of fir tree as a representation of the deep roots, the deep, deep, deep roots that this time of year has. So I was not raised with the song, O Christmas Tree. I was raised with the song, O Tannenbaum, O Tannenbaum, wie grün sind deine Blätter. Du grünst nicht nur zur Sommerzeit, but auch in Winter, wenn es schneit. O oh, Tannenbaum, O oh, Tannenbaum, wie grün sind deine Blätter. O oh, Tannenbaum does not translate into O oh, Christmas Tree. O oh, Tannenbaum correctly trans, well, O oh, Christmas Tree would actually be the original word would be O oh, Weihnachtsbaum. O oh, Tannenbaum means O oh, Fir Tree. And if you look at the English translation of O oh, Christmas Tree, which I actually truthfully don't know, I had to look up. <laughs> it's all about how lovely are your branches and your beauty. O oh, Christmas Tree, O oh, Christmas Tree, your beauty. All about how lovely and green you are and your beauty. Which is okay as it goes, but it's not what the original means. The original is not about a Christmas tree, it's about an evergreen tree, a fir tree. And it talks about that you're green in winter as well as in summer. And it says, you give me so much joy because of your greenness. And this greenness that you have that so fills me with joy is a teaching. It teaches me about hope and persistence. See, it just makes me, it just sometimes really irritates me the way that these things are co-opted and rewritten. It teaches me about, teaches me about hope and persistence. And it gives comfort and strength to every time, especially in the dark of the longest night. Persistence, hope, comfort, strength, joy, to me is a whole different message than your beauty is something that I think is lovely. Do you feel the difference? Yeah. Right? Oh, Tannenbaum was actually not a cute little kid song. It was actually a really powerful representation, uh, uh, sharing and expression of the beauty of the forest in winter, the pine forests in winter, and that they were still green and growing and alive despite the death of winter, the challenge of winter, the cold of winter. And so how many of us have had Christmas cards that actually have these winter scenes on them, that have the animals and the tree out in the forest? This, is, this it comes directly down to us from the northern European indigenous traditions that were there and celebrated for millennium before the Roman Empire brought Catholicism and Christianity. Of course, the same thing is true with the berry and the holly. 
the berry, the holly and the ivy. How many of us know that song, the holly and the ivy, right? And so for long before the turn from BCE to CE, or from, if you're from an older generation, from BC to AD, which of course makes the, um, the year that was associated with the birth of Jesus the like primary year. Um, and so long before that time, people in the north, in Europe, were decorating their homes with the evergreen boughs and the red berries. Why? Because they were bringing the Tannenbaum inside, right? They were bringing hope and persistence, comfort and strength right into their homes. No matter how cold and snowy and, and, and blizzardy it was outside, life was alive, and there is an aliveness here. Um, and, and so they decorated their halls long before um, uh, we brought them in as garlands. And of course, it was co-opted, as you may recall, as you may know, as the holly, as the crown of thorns, and the berries, the red berries, is the blood of Jesus. And so when you decorate your house with the garlands that is been now brought into Christmas as a way of celebrating the Christian story. But the story is actually much older than that as I've shared in this lovely childhood song. Now there's another um, song from, um, that I remember my mother singing um, um, when we would make Christmas cookies. And I'm wearing this beautiful um, red shawl because I got this from my mother when she passed away. It was one of the ones that I took from the stack of shawls. My mom was a shawl wearer, huge stack of silk and and other kinds of shawls, and um, yeah, because I, my mother, despite her deep roots in Christianity, this was her favorite, this was her favorite Christmas song, and it's called Leise Riesel der Schnee, and um, uh, Leise Riesel der Schnee, still und star ruht der See, Weihnachtlich glänzet der Wald, freue dich, Christkind, Kommt bald. Leise Riesel der Schnee is quietly falls the snow. Quiet and still rests the lake. The forest glistens like Christmas. Be joy filled. The Christ child is coming soon. And I still sing that song today, and I can feel the snow, right? We've all been in those snowfalls, and it's so quiet and beautiful and still, and the lakes and ponds are frozen, and there's peace. It's not about the blizzard. It's not about the cold. It's a it's this beautiful peace, and when the sun comes out, everything sparkles. And in this song, we're not waiting for Santa Claus. It's the Christ child that comes on Christmas Eve. It's not, this, it's not Santa Claus. It's not Saint Nick. It's not Santa Claus. It's the Christ child. And going through this, um, this beautiful winter scene, the next line starts with, but in our hearts it is warm. It is warm because of the beauty and the light of the forest. Of course, even though the forest is in snow. And do you see these songs have these ancient roots in a recognition that there is something deeper going on. And, and we're so embodied, we're so incarnated, that despite the fact that we're spiritual beings, I don't want to say despite, that's not quite, the, but despite the, 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 the constant desire to remember that we're spiritual beings, we are actually ensouled, embodied, incarnated, 
and are very much expressing that essential reality here, here on earth. And our roots in transcendentalism and our roots in Ernest Holmes and the science of mind continually reminds us that it is nature that teaches us about the universal principles. It's nature that teaches us about these deep, unequivocal truths. It's nature that shows us about the physical cycles of life and birth and death and how that is still the outpicturing of this eternal, immortal life as we see in the Tannenbaum forever green, providing us with hope, comfort, strength, and persistence. So all of these traditions are deeply rooted in the northern European, from, from actually from North Afri Africa all the way up through the northern European um, indigenous peoples. And has rested in our psyche for a really long time. And yet we've disembedded ourselves from that in our climate controlled life, right? We have, and we have wanted not only our homes to be always somewhere between 72 and 74, but, but we've also sort of assumed that our life should always be on go not recognizing that there are rhythms and seasons and we have forgotten that and we have to remember, uh, we have to remember to our well-being that we are not machines. Despite the fact that we use a machine as a metaphor for our bodies, we can use a machine and a computer as a metaphor for our brains. We actually are rooted here because this is one of the many, 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 many physical expressions and places where the infinite is actually being physical, created, expressed in this beauty. And that's what I remember from both of these songs is that there is such a deep recognition that life is beautiful and it is precious. And so, <laughs> what did we do with it? Besides the Christian um, overtaking of all of this, co-opting of all of this, then we have this lovely figure of Santa Claus. Um, I always heard that Santa Claus was from the 1940s from a Coca-Cola ad. It's actually not completely true. It was from an 1820 ad. <laughs> all 100 years before Coca-Cola. It was from an 1820 ad. Um, and, and using it to get rid of all the leftover goods in people sh on, on the shelves at the end of the year. They were trying to get rid of the inventory. So this little red elf-like figure began showing up in advertisements. And um, in, in, 18, um, in the 1830s, uh, a man named Mr. Moore wrote, "'Twas the night before Christmas," because he wanted people to stop roaming <laughs> the Wild West and the wild cities in the east and, he, and go home and be quiet to be um, more situated in, in their own homes. And it was a deliberate desire to wait for this little red man who was going to bring all of the goodies that the, somebody had gone to the store and purchased. It's just fascinating. Fascinating how all of this, and of course, hearkening back to the um, St. Nicholas in Europe and Sinta Klaus in Denmark, um, which you may not know, actually was celebrated on the 6th of December, not on Christmas Eve, actually celebrated on the 6th of December. So co-opting and co-opting and co-opting and taking it in. Um, does it make it bad? No. It doesn't make it bad at all. It, makes, it helps us remember that there's more going on. And to not become hyper-focused on any one particular thing and say this is the meaning of Christmas. This is the meaning of the holidays. There's lots of meanings and lots of things that we can really allow ourselves to lean into. So, 
so <laughs> I must confess that I was taught to give a talk. When I was taught to give a talk, you have to have three points. You have to have a point, and <laughs> you have to lead people through three points to the point so that you can inspire them to something. And I'm not doing that today. Um, so, so what you're getting to hear is what goes on in my brain. This is what goes on in my brain. So this is, like an, this, this is more like an essay. Today is more like an essay. All of the parts are a little bit disparate. They don't necessarily follow in some linear fashion, point A, point one, point two, point three. So I just invite you to explore with me or, or maybe some new idea because there were some things in here I didn't know. And um, yeah, the winter solstice, yeah. We all know what the winter solstice, right? Longest day, three long nights, and, and of course, up in the north, that meant it was dark the entire time. They barely got twilight. The sun didn't even rise above the horizon if you were in the very far north. And um, yeah, that was like, and just like Stonehenge and lots of places around the world, lots of things were done to construct and understand the heavens. They were not just purely um, hoping that it wouldn't stay dark forever. They actually knew that. And they were ceremonially bringing back the light or reminding themselves that despite the darkness, the light was coming back. Um, and, um, and so these traditions were found in Northern Europe and um, as I, all those ways we've just talked about were brought into the idea of the Christian tradition. Um, and then there came this word that was associated now with winter solstice. Um, and that word is pagan, paganism. And um, if you don't know, pagan basically, was, it was um, coined in the fourth century and it means non-Christian. That's what pagan means. Heathen and infidel also means non-my religion, right? Heathen is non-Christian, infidel is non-Muslim, but they have a little more of a bite to them. There's a little more of a pejorative idea. Pagan just really is, these are the indigenous traditions and they are non-Christian. They are associated with those groups that are polytheistic, animistic, and pantheistic. We also find those all over the world in indigenous traditions, all over the world, native traditions um, on every continent. What's more important than those academic words is the idea of nature. Now, once again, I think an unconscious bias is being shown when in everything that you read about it, it says nature worship. Because from a Christian point of view, the only way to engage with the divine or the spirit is to worship it. When in fact, if you think about anything that you know about Native American traditions, which is true in all traditions, there is something much deeper going on than worshiping nature. There is a revelation that nature is bringing. There is a relationship that is being experienced. There is a deep recognition of the oneness that a human being has in its own embedded world with the animals and the plants and everything that's going on, the stars and the sun and the moon, there's a massive amount of recognition of that relationship. And there is a deep desire to be in alignment with it. To allow it to inform us Who is it who wrote sermons in the stones? Hearing the hands clap, hallelujah, right? Nature, worship, eh, I'm not quite sure what word we would do, what we, word we would use. I would use nature communion. The communing with nature, with these spirits. Now, paganism was not self-applied by any of these people. 
um, it was applied by the Christians. And ultimately, one of the key ideas was, the idea was that, the, it, that these people were worshiping false gods. So that's where the little bit of pejorative nature comes in with Christianity, with using this word pagan, and that it was primarily rural and provincial, you know, those, those people that are out there. You know, well, what do they know? They, they don't live in the cities. They're not sophisticated enough. They don't, they, don't really, they don't really get what we're doing here. Because rural people in all times and places live closer to the earth, more in tune with it than we do as we go around our climate-controlled lives. Yeah. So the next thing that comes to mind is today we talk about not just pagan but Wiccan. And I always thought Wiccan was like old, like Celtic and Druidic and not. It's not. The Wiccan tradition actually was birthed in the 1930s. Um, and we might call it neo-paganism. It's modern paganism, and it's the, it's the reconstructing or the, the reacquainting ourselves with these older traditions. Um, there, it, there's there's uh, um, versions of it that are hermetic, um, that are uh, um, what we would consider purely Wiccan, that are Hellenistic, and are, and are associated in a lot of ways with New Age. And so there's this whole resurgence in the 1930s with this deep appreciation for and desire to re-engage with nature. Again, I would submit to us that this is very much in alignment with science of mind if you look at Ernest Holmes's continued conversation about nature with, with the uh, roots in the transcendentalists um, and the romantic poets and the romantic painters, all of whom found spirit in nature and to break out of some of the cultural norms and to move into a larger expression. So I found this, which I thought was really interesting. Wiccans worship nature, often personified as Mother Earth and Father Sky. They can use many different titles for their deities. Um, and respect, uh, choose particular gods or goddesses from different religions around, these, around the world, respecting all traditions. And, and I love this idea, right, that when we are really recognizing the, the teaching that's available in nature, it makes us more inclusive. There's something worth contemplating. The teachings in nature make us more inclusive if we allow them to reveal something to us. Most Wiccan covens also practice magic in which they, listen to this, direct and use universal energy to affect an entity to a desired result. Some call it magic with an M-I-G-I-K as you see up there on, as you see up there on the screen to um, not mistake it for sleight of hand. And there is a threefold rule, that a rule of threefold return. Positive magic directed towards someone will come back three times, but so will negative. And so in this, these traditions, the pagan tradition and the Wiccan tradition, which has a whole boatload of interesting things associated with it, from the history of the last 2,000 years, there's something so profound in the recognition that not only does nature teach us inclusivity, it teaches us how to be for life, which we translate into for good. Nature isn't moral, it's not necessarily ethical, but it's always about more life for life, for growth, for a fuller expression. And isn't that what we wish for ourselves and others? And is so much what we do in our spiritual mind treatment. 
When you do an incantation in Wicca, in Wiccan, it um, usually ends in either blessed be or um, as I will it, so mote it be. And what do we say? And so it is, right? And so it is. There's something so, um, yeah, inviting about this deep, engagement with, la with nature that we lose and have lost in many ways at our peril. So we come to the winter solstice, and the winter solstice is generally sh uh, shown as, the, can, as the, you know, the light has disappeared. Now we have to do something with the darkness, so the light comes back. And I loved Amy Martin's winter solstice um, program that we were involved in for many, 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 many years because she always recognized that these two things are not in opposition. Light and dark are not in opposition. And um, they are actually somehow moving together. And, and yet we, so often, we have this idea of the hero's journey, right? And I'm a big one. I love Harry Potter. I love the, you know, um, Lord of the Rings, um, Joseph Campbell's stuff, Star Wars, right? It's all the same. It's the typical hero's journey. And in the hero's journey, good is always versus evil. Light is always versus dark. And in our, in our spirituality, light can be always about illuminating enlightenment and seeking something that is good, and the dark usually has fear associated with it or something that we want to overcome, especially when we think <coughs> of our shadow. And yet, those of us who live in Dallas, perhaps you, you have this experience wherever you're living, isn't sometimes the light too much? Too much, too hot, too harsh. Think of an interrogation light. While light can illuminate and can bring things forward, it also can be too much and too strong and too harsh. And so while the dark is often associated with fear, there's something about the dark in these beautiful two songs that I shared with you where the dark, the winter is actually restful not something to be afraid of. It's restful. It has beauty in its own um, right, and it's inviting itself, us, to have something be revealed to us. And the light is forever ex um, illuminating the exterior of things. It seems to me that it is in the dark that the interior is made available because the ultimate association with the dark is the womb. And then I have my beloved who is an amazing photographer and she has taught me about this thing called the golden hour. One hour before sunrise and one hour before sunset. The golden hour. And it is actually during the golden hour that you wanna take pictures because in the sun, in the, in the middle of the day, the sun's too bright, it's too harsh, makes too many shadows, and that, sal that doesn't make your skin look really pretty either. And in the dark, obviously, you can't see anything or you have to hold the camera really still for a really long time or everything is blurry. The golden hour, the hour before sunrise, and or sorry, after sunrise, I did that backwards, didn't I? That's my, there's my dyslexia right there. Okay, so it should actually say an hour after sunrise <laughs> and before sunset. <laughs> Sorry about that. And this is, <clears throat> and, and you get the truest, softest, most beautiful colors, and it's in this transition time. You know, and I saw it, see, this is my musings about winter solstice. We always focus on the light and the dark and blah, blah, blah. And, and so I kept thinking about the golden hour, but the golden hour. Yeah. One of the things nature teaches us is that time and life are not black and white. They're not. Things don't just start or stop. It's not good or bad. It's not happy or sad. All in like discrete, it's either this or it's that. There's not always a beginning or an end identifiable. We're not saved or doomed. We're not perfect or awful. Yeah. 
I think what nature teaches us is that everything is just a shade of gray. And I think that's what the yin-yang symbol is about. You know, what you may not know is that the yin-yang symbol is, symbol is actually supposed to be seen as a moving representation. It's not static. And if, you, if it's moving and moving well, the, the, uh, the, the, the two um, pieces are basically chasing each other around the circle to a certain extent, but what's really happening is the dark is coming into the light and the light is coming into the dark. That's why those two little dots are there. And they're actually like shifting places. And it's a constantly moving, these things are constantly happening. So life is both happy and sad, right? And we are complex enough beings that we can actually hold that. Life is both good and bad. Life is all of that in this experience. We know that that's not necessarily true from the absolute point of view. But what winter solstice and the nature traditions give us is a, is a, a falling back in love with our humanity, our physicality, and the beauty that's here for us and how much nature can give to us in that, and how we lose nature at our peril. So, you know, this week, I've really been spending a lot of time on this, and I invite you to do the same. Spend time with this idea that you are part of the earth, too. It's not about what's right and what's wrong. It's about the beauty of growth and evolution and the cycles and the seasons. And in all of that, life reveals itself to us if we are paying attention. I think that is what we could be celebrating when we are celebrating the cosmic light.